Hatchet by Gary Paulson. Chapter 1 Brian Robeson stared out the window of the small plane at the endless green northern wilderness below. It was a small plane, a Cessna 406, a bush plane, and the engine was so loud, so roaring and consuming and loud, that it ruined any chance for conversation. Not that he had much to say. He was 13, and the only passenger on the plane was a pilot named, what was it, Jim or Jake or something, who had been in his mid-forties and who had been silent as he worked to prepare for takeoff. In fact, since Brian had come to the small airport in Hampton, New York, to meet the plane, driven by his mother, the pilot had only spoken five words to him. Get in the co-pilot seat, which Brian had done. They'd taken off, and that was the last of the conversation. There had been the initial excitement, of course. He'd never flown in a single-engine plane before, and to be sitting in the co-pilot seat with all the controls right there in front of him, all the instruments in his face as the plane clawed for altitude, jerking and sliding on the wind currents as the pilot took off, had been interesting and exciting. But in five minutes, they leveled off at 6,000 feet and headed northwest, and from then on the pilot had been silent, staring out the front, and the drone of the engine had been all that was left. The drone and the sea of green trees that lay before the plane's nose and flowed to the horizon, spread with lakes, swamps, and wandering streams and rivers. Now, Brian sat, looking out the window with a roar thundering through his ears, and tried to catalog what had led up to his taking this flight. The thinking started. Always it started with a single word. Divorce. It was an ugly word, he thought. A tearing, ugly word that meant fights and yelling. Lawyers, God, he thought how he hated lawyers, who sat with their comfortable smiles and tried to explain to him, in legal terms, how all that he lived in was coming apart, and the breaking and shattering of all the solid things, his home, his life, all the solid things. Divorce, a breaking word, an ugly breaking word. Divorce. Secrets. Eh, not secrets, so much as just the secret. What he knew, and had not told anybody. What he knew about his mother that had caused the divorce. What he knew. What he knew. The secret. Divorce. The secret. Brian felt his eyes beginning to burn, and he knew there would be tears. He cried for a time, but that was gone now. He didn't cry now. Instead, his eyes burned, and tears came. The seeping tears that burned, but he didn't cry. He wiped his eyes with a finger and looked at the pilot out of the corner of his eye to make sure he hadn't noticed the burning and tears. The pilot sat large, his hands lightly on the wheel, feet on the rudder pedals. He seemed more a machine than a man, an extension of the plane. On the dashboard in front of him, Brian saw the dials, switches, beaters, knobs, levers, cranks, lights, handles that were wiggling and flickering, all indicating nothing that he understood, and the pilot seemed the same way, part of the plane not human. When he saw Brian look at him, the pilot seemed to open up a bit, and he smiled. Ever fly in the co-pilot seat before? He leaned over and lifted the headset off his right ear and put it on his temple, yelling to overcome the sound of the engine. Brian shook his head. He'd never been in any kind of plane, never seen the cockpit of a plane, except in films or television. It was loud and confusing. First time. Not as complicated as it looks. Good plane like this, Almost flies itself, the pilot shrugged. Makes my job easy. He took Brian's left arm. Here, put your hands on the controls, your feet on the rudder pedals. I'll show you what I mean. Brian shook his head. I'd better not. Sure, try it. Brian reached out and took the wheel in a grip so tight his knuckles were white. He pushed his feet down on the pedals. The plane slewed suddenly to the right. Not so hard. Take her light. Take her light. Brian eased off, relaxed his grip. The burning in his eyes was forgotten momentarily, as the vibration of the plane came through the wheel and the pedals. It seemed almost alive. See? The pilot let go of his wheel, raised his hands in the air, and took his feet off the pedals to show Brian he was actually flying the plane alone. Simple! Now turn the wheel a little to the right and push on the right rudder pedal a small amount. Brian turned the wheel slightly, and the plane immediately banked to the right and when he pressed on the right rudder pedal, the nose slid across the horizon to the right. He left off the pressure and straightened the wheel, and the plane righted itself. Now you can turn. Bring her back to the left a little. Brian turned the wheel left, pushed on the left pedal, and the plane came back around. It's easy, he smiled. At least this part. 
The pilot nodded. All of flying is easy. Just takes learning, like everything else. Like everything else. He took the controls back, then reached up and rubbed his left shoulder. Aches and pains. <laughs> Must be getting old. Brian let go of the controls and moved his feet away from the pedals as the pilot put his hands on the wheel. Thank you. But the pilot had put his headset back on, and the gratitude was lost in the engine noise, and things went back to Brian looking out the window at the ocean of trees and lakes. The burning eyes did not come back, but memories did, came flooding in. The words, always the words. Divorce. The secret. Fights. Split. The big split. His father did not understand as Brian did. He knew only that Brian's mother wanted to break the marriage apart. The split had come, and then the divorce, all so fast, and the court had left him with his mother, except for the summers, and what the judge called visitation rights. So formal, Brian hated judges, as he hated lawyers. Judges that leaned over the bench and asked Brian if he understood where he was to live and why. Judges with a caring look that meant nothing, as lawyers said legal phrases that meant nothing. In the summer, Brian would live with his father, and the school year with his mother. And that's what the judge said after looking at papers on his desk and listening to the lawyers talk. Talk. Words. Now the plane lurched slightly to the right, and Brian looked at the pilot. He was rubbing his shoulder again, and there was the sudden smell of body gas in the plane. Brian turned back to avoid embarrassing the pilot, who was obviously in some discomfort. Must have stomach troubles. So this summer, this first summer when he was allowed to have visitation rights with his father, with the divorce only one month old, Brian was heading north. His father was a mechanical engineer who had designed or invented a, a new drill bit for oil drilling, a self-cleaning, self-sharpening bit. He was working in the oil fields of Canada, up on the tree line where the tundra started and the forests ended. Brian was riding up from New York with some drilling equipment. He was lashed down in the rear of the plane next to a fabric bag the pilot had called a survival pack, which had emergency supplies in case they had to make an emergency landing that had to be specially made in the city, riding in the bush plane with a pilot named Jim or Jake or something, who turned out to be an all right guy, letting him fly the plane and all, except for the smell. Now there was a constant odor, and Brian took another look at the pilot, found him rubbing the shoulder and down the arm now, the left arm, letting go more gas and wincing. Probably something he ate, Brian thought. His mother had driven him from the city to meet the plane at Hampton where it came to pick up the drilling equipment. A drive in silence, a long drive in silence. Two and a half hours of sitting in the car, staring out the window of the plane. Once, after an hour, when they were out of the city, she turned to him. Look, can't we talk this over? Can't we talk this out? Can't you tell me what's bothering you? And there were the words again. Divorce. Split. The secret. How could he tell her what he knew? So he had remained silent, shook his head, and continued to stare, unseeing, at the countryside, and his mother had gone back to driving, only to speak to him one more time when they were close to Hampton. She reached over the back of the seat and brought up a paper sack. I got something for you, for the trip. Brian took the sack and opened the top. Inside, there was a hatchet the kind with a steel handle and a rubber hand grip. The head was in a stout leather case that had a brass riveted belt loop. It goes on your belt. His mother spoke now, without looking at him. There were some farm trucks on the roads now, and she had to weave through them and watch traffic. The man at the store said you could use it, you know, in the woods with your father. Dad, he thought, not my father, my dad. Thanks, it's really nice. But the word sounded hollow, even to Brian. Try it on. See how it looks on your belt. And he normally would have said no. Would normally have said that, no, that it looks too hokey to have a hatchet on your belt. Those were the normal things he would say. But her voice was thin. Had a sound like something thin that would break if you touched it. And he felt bad for not speaking to her. Knowing what he knew, even with the anger, the hot white hate of his anger at her, he still felt bad for not speaking to her. And so to humor her, he loosened his belt and pulled the right side out and put the hatchet on, and re-threaded the belt. Scoot around so I can see. He moved around in the seat, feeling only slightly ridiculous. She nodded. Just like a scout, my little scout. And there was the tenderness in her voice that she had when he was small, the tenderness that she had when he was small and sick, 
with a cold, and she put her hand on his forehead, and the burning came into his eyes again, and he had turned away from her and looked out the window, forgotten the hatchet on his belt, and so he arrived at the plane with the hatchet still on his belt. Because it was a bush flight from a small airport, there'd been no security, and the plane had been waiting, with the engine running when he arrived, and he grabbed his suitcase and pack bag and run for the plane without stopping to remove the hatchet. So it was still on his belt. At first he'd been embarrassed, but the pilot had said nothing about it, and Brian forgot it as they took off and began flying. More smell now. Bad. Brian turned again to glance at the pilot, who had both hands on his stomach, and was grimacing in pain, reaching for the left shoulder again as Brian watched. Don't know, kid. The pilot's words were a hiss, barely audible. Bad aches here. Bad aches. I thought it was something I ate, but... He stopped as a fresh spasm of pain hit him. Even Brian could see how bad it was. The pain drove the pilot back into the seat, back and down. I've never had anything like this. The pilot reached for the switch on his mic cord, his hand coming up in a small arc from his stomach, and he flipped the switch and said, This is flight four, six. And now a jolt took him like a hammer blow so forcefully that he seemed to crush back into the seat, and Brian reached for him, could not understand at first what it was, could not know. And then he knew. Brian knew. The pilot's mouth went rigid. He swore and jerked a short series of slams into the seat, holding his shoulder now, swore and hissed, Chest! Oh, God, my chest is coming apart! Brian knew now. The pilot was having a heart attack. Brian had been in a shopping mall with his mother, when a man in front of Paisley's store had suffered a heart attack, he'd gone down and screamed about his chest. An old man, much older than the pilot. Brian knew. The pilot was having a heart attack, and even as the knowledge came to Brian, he saw the pilot slam into the seat one more time, one more awful time he slammed back into the seat, and his right leg jerked, pulling the plane to the side in a sudden twist, and his head fell forward, and spit came. Spit came from the corners of his mouth, and his legs contracted up, up into the seat, and his eyes rolled back in his head until there was only white. Only white for his eyes. And the smell became worse. It filled the cockpit, and all of it so fast, so incredibly fast, that Brian's mind could not take it in at first. He could only see it in stages. The pilot had been talking just a moment ago, complaining of the pain. He'd been talking. Then the jolts had come. The jolts that took the pilot back had come, and now Brian sat, and there was a strange feeling of silence and the thrumming roar of the engine, a strange feeling of silence and being alone. Brian was stopped. He was stopped. Inside, he was stopped. He could not think past what he saw, what he felt. All was stopped. The very core of him, the very center of Brian Robeson, was stopped and stricken with a white flash of horror, a terror so intense that his breathing, his thinking, and nearly his heart had stopped. Stopped. Seconds passed. Seconds that became all of his life. They began to know what he was seeing, began to understand what he saw, and that was worse. So much worse that he wanted to make his mind freeze again. He was sitting in a bush plane, roaring 7,000 feet above the northern wilderness with a pilot who had suffered a massive heart attack and was either dead or in something close to a coma. He was alone, in a roaring plane. With no pilot, he was alone. Alone. Chapter 2 For a time that he could not understand, Brian could do nothing. Even after his mind began working and he could see what had happened, he could do nothing. It was as if his hands and arms were lead. Then he looked for ways for it not to have happened. Be asleep, his mind screamed at the pilot. Just be asleep, and your eyes will open now, and your hands will take the controls, and your feet will move the pedals. But it did not happen. The pilot did not move, except that his head rolled on a neck impossibly loose as the plane hit a small bit of turbulence. The plane. Somehow, the plane was still flying. Seconds had passed, nearly a minute, and the plane flew on as if nothing had happened. And he had to do something. He had to do something, but did not know what. Help. He had to help. He stretched one hand toward the pilot, saw that his fingers were trembling, and touched the pilot on the chest. He did not know what to do. He knew there were procedures, that you could do mouth-to-mouth -mouth on victims of heart attacks, 
and push their chests, CPR, but he didn't know how to do it, and in any case, he could not do it with the pilot, who was sitting up in the seat, still strapped in with his seatbelt. So he touched the pilot with the tips of his fingers, touched him on the chest, and could feel nothing. No heartbeat, no rise and fall of breathing, which meant the pilot was almost certainly dead. Please, Brian said, but did not know what or who to ask. Please. The plane lurched again, hit more turbulence, and Brian felt the nose drop. It did not dive, but the nose went down slightly, and the down angle increased the speed, and he knew that at this angle, this slight angle down, he would ultimately fly into the trees. He could see them ahead on the horizon, before he could see only sky. He had to fly it somehow. He had to fly the plane. He had to help himself. The pilot was gone, beyond anything he could do. He had to try and fly the plane. He turned back in the seat, facing the front, and put his hands, still trembling, on the control wheel, his feet gently on the rudder pedals. He pulled back on the stick to raise the plane. He knew that from reading. He always pulled back the wheel. He gave it a tug, and it slid back easily toward him. Too easily. The plane, with the increased speed from the tilt down, swooped eagerly up and drove Brian's stomach down. He pushed the wheel back in, went too far this time, and the plane's nose went below the horizon, and the engine speed increased with the shallow dive. Too much. He pulled back again, more gently this time, and the nose floated up again. Too far, but not as violently as before, then down a bit too much, and up again as before, then down a bit too much, and up again very easily, and the front of the engine cowling settled. When he had it aimed at the horizon, and it seemed to be steady, he held the wheel where it was, let out his breath, which he'd been holding all this time, and tried to think of what to do next. It was a clear blue sky day, with fluffy bits of clouds here and there, and he looked out the window for a moment, hoping to see something, a town or village, but there was nothing, just the green of trees, endless green, and lakes scattered more thickly as the plane flew. Where? He was flying, but didn't know where. Had no idea where he was going. He looked at the dashboard of the plane, studied the dials, and hoped to get some help, hoped to find a compass, but it was all so confusing, a jumble of numbers and lights. One lighted display on the top center of the dashboard said the number 342. Another next to it said 22. Down below that were dials with lines that seemed to indicate what the wind were doing, tipping or moving, and one dial with a needle pointing to the number 70, which he thought, only thought, might be the altimeter, the device that told him his height above the ground, or above sea level. Somewhere he'd read about altimeters, but he couldn't remember what, or where, or anything about them. Slightly to the left and below the altimeter, he saw a small rectangular panel with a lighted dial and two knobs. His eyes had passed it over two or three times before he saw what it was written in tiny letters on top of the panel. Transmitter 221 was stamped in the metal, and it hit him finally that this was the radio. The radio, of course, he had to use the radio. When the pilot had, had been hit that way, he couldn't bring himself to think that or say that the pilot was dead, couldn't think it, he'd been trying to use the radio. Brian looked at the pilot. The headset was still on his head, turned sideways a bit from his jamming back into the seat, and the microphone switch was clipped into his belt. Brian had to get the headset from the pilot. He had to reach over and get the headset from the pilot, or he would not be able to use the radio to call for help. He had to reach over. His hands began trembling again. He did not want to touch the pilot, did not want to reach for him, but he had to. He had to get the radio. He lifted his hands from the wheel just slightly and held them, waiting to see what would happen. The plane flew on normally, smoothly. All right, he thought. Now, now to do this thing. He turned and reached for the headset, slid it from the pilot's head, one eye on the plane, waiting for it to dive. The headset came easily, but the microphone switch of the pilot's belt was jammed in, and he had to pull it to get it loose. When he pulled, his elbow bumped the wheel and pushed it in, and the plane started down in a shallow dive. Brian grabbed the wheel and pulled it back, too hard again, and the plane went through another series of stomach-wrenching swoops up and down before he could get it under control. When things had settled again, he pulled at the mic cord once more, and at last jerked the cord free. It took him another second or two to place the headset on his own head and position the small microphone tube in front of his mouth. He'd seen the pilot use it, 
had seen him depress the switch at his belt, so Brian put the switch in and blew into the mic. He heard the sound of his breath in the headset. Hello? Hello, is anybody listening to this? Hello? He repeated it two or three times and then waited, but heard nothing except his own breathing. Panic came then. He'd been afraid, had been stopped with the terror of what was happening, but now panic came, and he began to scream into the microphone, scream over and over. Help! Somebody help me! I'm in this plane and I don't know! Don't know! Don't know! And he started crying with the screams, crying and slamming his hands against the wheel of the plane, causing it to jerk down, then back up. But again, he heard nothing but the sound of his own sobs in the microphone, his own screams mocking him, coming back into his ears. The microphone. Awareness cut into him. He had used a CB radio in his uncle's pickup once. He had to turn the mic switch off to hear anybody else. He reached to his belt and released the switch. For a second, all he heard was the whoosh of empty airwaves. Then, through the noise and static, he heard a voice. Whoever's calling on this radio net, I repeat, release your mic switch. You're covering me. You are covering me. Over. It stopped, and Brian hit his mic switch. I hear you. I hear you. This is me. He released the switch. Roger, I have you now. The voice was very faint and breaking up. Please state your difficulty and location and say over to end the transmission. Over. State my difficulty, Brian thought. God, my difficulty? Uh, I'm in a plane with a pilot who is, uh, he can't fly. and I don't know how to fly. Help me, help. He turned his mic off without ending the transmission properly. There was a moment's hesitation before the answer. Signal's breaking up, and I lost most of it. Understand, pilot can't fly. C correct, over. Brian could barely hear him now. Heard mostly noise and static. That's right, I can't fly. The plane is flying now, but I don't know how much longer. Over. Lost signal. Your location, please. Flight number. Location. Er. I don't know my flight number or location. I don't know anything. I told you that. Over. He waited now. Waited, but there was nothing. Once for a second, he thought he heard a break in the noise. Some part of a word. But it could have been static. Two, three minutes, ten minutes. The plane roared, and Brian listened but heard no one. Then he hit the switch again. I do not know my flight number. My name is Brian Robeson, and we left Hampton, New York, headed for the Canadian oil fields to visit my father, and I do not know how to fly an airplane, and the pilot... He let go of the mic. His voice was starting to rattle, and he felt as if he might start screaming at any second. He took a deep breath. If there's anybody listening who can help me fly a plane, please answer. Again, he released the mic but heard nothing, and the hissing of noise in the headset. After a half an hour of listening and repeating the cry for help, he tore the headset off in frustration and threw it to the floor. It all seemed so hopeless. Even if he did get somebody, what could anybody do? Tell him to be careful? It all so hopeless. He tried to figure out the dials again. He thought he might know which was the speed. It was a lighted number that read 160, but he didn't know if that was actual miles an hour or kilometers, or if it just meant how fast the plane was moving through the air and not over the ground. He knew airspeed was different from ground speed, but not by how much. Parts of books he'd read about flying came to him, how wings worked, how the propeller pulled the plane through the sky. Simple things that wouldn't help him now. Nothing could help him now. An hour passed. He picked up the headset and tried again. It was, he knew in the end, all he had but there was no answer. He felt like a prisoner, kept in a small cell that was hurtling through the sky at what he thought to be 160 miles an hour, headed, he didn't know where, just headed somewhere, until there it was. Until what? Until he ran out of fuel. When the plane ran out of fuel, it would go down, period. Or he could pull the throttle out and make it go down now. He'd seen the pilot push the throttle in to increase the speed. If he pulled the throttle back out, the engine would slow down and the plane would go down. Those were his choices. He could wait for the plane to run out of gas and fall, or he could push the throttle in and make it happen sooner. If he waited for the plane to run out of fuel, he would go farther, but he didn't know which way he was moving. When the pilot had jerked, he'd moved the plane. 
Brian could not remember how much or if it had come back to its original course, since he didn't know the original course anyway and could only guess at which display might be the compass, the one reading 342, he did not know where he'd been or where he was going, so it didn't make much difference if he went down now or waited. Everything in him rebelled against stopping the engine and falling now. He had a vague feeling that he was wrong to keep heading as the plane was heading, a feeling that he might be going off in the wrong direction, but he could not bring himself to stop the engine and fall. Now he was safe, or safer than if he went down. The plane was flying. He was still breathing. When the engine stopped, he would go down. So he left the plane running, holding altitude, and kept trying the radio. He worked out a system. Every ten minutes, by the small clock built into the dashboard, he tried the radio with a simple message. I need help. Is there anybody listening to me? In the times between transmissions, he tried to prepare himself for what he knew was coming. When he ran out of fuel, the plane would start down. He guessed that, without the propeller pulling, he would have to push the nose down to keep the plane flying. He thought he may have read that somewhere, or it just came to him. Either way, it made sense. He would have to push the nose down to keep flying speed, and then, just before he hit, he would have to pull the nose back up to slow the plane as much as possible. It all made sense. Glide down, then slow the plane, and hit. Hit. He would have to find a clearing as he went down. The problem was that, since he hadn't seen one clearing since they'd started flying the f over the forest. Some swamps, but they had trees scattered through them. No roads, no trails, no clearings. Just the lakes. And it came to him that he would have to use a lake for the landing. If he went down in the trees, he was certain to die. The trees would tear the plane to pieces as it went into them. He would have to come down in a lake. No, on the edge of a lake. He would have to come down near the edge of a lake and try to slow the plane as much as possible just before he hit the water. Easy to say, hard, he thought, hard to do. Easy say, hard do, easy say, hard do. It became a chant that beat with the engine. Easy say, hard do. Impossible to do. He repeated the radio call 17 times at 10 minute intervals, working on what he would do between transmissions. Once more, he reached over to the pilot and touched him on the face, but the skin was cold, hard cold, death cold, and Brian turned back to the dashboard. He did what he could, tightened his seatbelt, positioned himself, rehearsed mentally again and again what his procedure should be. When the plane ran out of gas, he should hold the nose down and head for the nearest lake and try to fly the plane kind of onto the water. That's how he thought of it. Kind of fly the plane onto the water. And just before it hit, he should pull back on the wheel, slow the plane to reduce the impact. Over and over, his mind ran the picture of how it would go. The plane running out of gas, flying the plane onto the water. The crash from pictures he'd seen on television. He tried to visualize it. He tried to be steady or be ready. But between the 17th and 18th radio transmissions, without a warning, the engine coughed, roared violently for a second, and died. There was a sudden silence, cut only by the sound of the wind-milling propeller and the wind past the cockpit. Brian pushed the nose of the plane down and threw up. 